Occupational English Test Sample Test 1 Listening Test This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Hello, Mrs. Hansen. I'm Dr. Hudson. Hello. We, I understand you're having some pain. Oh, yes, I have that stomach pain. Yes. When did it start? Last night. Last night. Yeah. About what time? Nine. Nine. Yeah. Where was it when it first started? It was well, kind of generalized. All around? Yeah. Okay. Did it change at all? Yeah. Where? How did it change? No, at this morning when I woke up, it was more central. Okay. And now it's it's more of the ear. On the right side. Yeah. What kind of pain is it? Uh, it's it's really, it's right there. Okay. Uh, and it's constant. It's constant. Yeah. Is it like a grabbing pain, a stabbing pain, uh, a dull ache? Dull ache. A dull yeah. ache. Yeah. Is it going around the back at no. all, down in the groin area? No. It's just right there yeah. now. Okay. Yeah. But it started more generalized. Yeah. Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, last night, how bad was the pain? I would say a 2. A 2. Yeah. And now, what would you say? A uh, 7. A 7. Okay. When it first started, were you doing anything in particular? Did you lift something heavy? No, I was Did you just, twist? Was well, there any trauma? I was just looking at the TV. Okay. Yeah. All right. Through the night, did it wake you up? No, I slept. You were able okay, to sleep? Yeah. Okay. Do you feel nauseated? Uh, this morning, This yeah. morning. Did you throw up? Yeah, when, an hour ago. An hour ago. Yeah. How's your appetite? Do you feel hungry? Do you want to uh, eat? Oh, no. You don't, no. Eh? Okay. Did you have any fever? Uh, I did not take it, but now I feel kind of feverish. Yeah. You feel a bit feverish. Yeah. Did you have any night sweats last night? No. No, or chills where you were shaking. No, but this morning, a few hours ago, it started. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about your bowel movements. When was the last one? Uh, yesterday morning. Okay. Yeah. Was it normal? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a period of time in the last week or so where you were either constipated or had diarrhea? No. Have you recently noticed any blood in your stools? No. Or any black diarrhea stool? No. No. Are you having problems with? Um, bladder in terms of burning to urinate, mm. having to get up at night to urinate. No. No. Uh, have you seen any blood in your urine? No. No. Okay. Tell me about your periods. Do you still menstruate? No. No, no. It stopped five years ago. Five years ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. And you haven't had any spotting, any bleeding at all? No. no. Um, and um, are you sexually active? Uh, not for the last six months. Last, no new partners then no. for the six months. Okay, no. all right. Have you ever had any problems with this kind of pain before? No. Similar no. pain? No. No, this is the first time. No. Tell me about your health. Do you have any other medical problems? No. High blood pressure, cholesterol problems, heart problems? No. Do you take medications? Uh, just the home homeopathic. Uh, homeopathic one. Yeah. Okay, which ones are those? Uh, <laughs> Prime rose. <laughs> I'm sorry. I take selenium and I yeah. take vitamin C and A and primrose tablets. Primrose tablets. Yeah. Okay. Do you take any aspirin at all? No. No. Okay. Any Advil, ibuprofen? No. Uh, no. Okay. Do you have allergies to medications? No. No. Have you ever had surgery before? 
No. No. Um, so you don't know if you have any issues regarding general anesthetic? Um, no. Problems like that. Family history in particular of bleeding tendencies or blood clot problems? No. No. Okay. Um, have you ever had kidney infections or bladder infections? Never. No. All right. Okay. So I'm going to examine you. Okay. So if you want to bring your legs down here, just bring them down gently. I know it's going to hurt a little bit. Yeah. Okay. And now I'm going to just have a look at your abdomen. Okay. So we're going to just expose here. And I'm going to look to see if your abdomen is distended. Do you feel bloated at all with your belly all swollen up? No. Okay. So it looks good. I don't see any swelling of your abdomen or any bulging anywhere. So uh, now I'm going to um, give little taps, okay? So show me the area where you're sore. Here. Here. Okay. So we're going to save that spot for last. So I'm just going to give little punches here. That hurts you a bit, eh? Okay. Now I'm just going to lightly palpate just on the top like that. That's all okay? How about down here? That hurts a bit, eh? Okay. Now I'm going to go deeper down, okay? That's okay there. And if I press here, do you feel it a bit? Or where do you feel that when I'm pressing here? So you feel it on that side, okay. Now I'm going to go deeper here, okay. So I do see that your muscles are tensing up when I'm doing that, okay. I'm going to do another test where I'm going to press down and I'm going to let go, okay? So you tell me if it hurts. So I'm going to press yeah. down. I know it hurts here. I'm going to let go. Okay, that does hurt, eh? Now I'm going to do it on this side too. I'm going to press down. Okay, I'm going to let go. Oh, that really hurts. Okay, sorry about that. Now I'm going to listen for your bowel sounds, okay? And I should, should have done this before palpating you. Um, but let me have a listen here, okay? So I'm just going to listen in all four quadrants, in all area of the abdomen. Very good. So your bowel sounds are okay. So we see that um, the gas is, is flowing through, that there's no blockage there. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you to lift up your leg. Okay, and keep it up. So well, let's bring your leg out of the blanket. It'll make it easier for you. Just bring it up in the air like that. And just oh. don't let me push your leg down. You tell me if it hurts. Oh, That oh. does hurt, eh? Okay, all right. So let's bring this down. Okay, and now I'm just going to be pressing a little bit on your kidneys back here. Does that hurt you? No. Okay, and how about on this side? Does that hurt you? And that's good, very good. Now, I'm going to want to have uh, a little bit of an examination to look at your tubes and your ovaries, uh, what we call a gynecological examination. Exam is normal. Very good. And another thing that we need to do is do a rectal examination, and that's to put a finger in and feel the area that where the... examination is normal as well. It is normal. Okay, very good. Um, so, that concludes... Um, I have a question for you. What's your diagnosis? Well, my principal uh, diagnosis is appendicitis at this point. Hi, Mr. Feldman. How are you today? Um, okay, Mr. Feldman, I'd like to take a look at your leg now, if you don't mind. Sure. I'd like you to lie down, if you would, please. Okay. There you go. Based on what you've told me so far, I suspect you have a problem with the circulation in your leg and that the arterial blood flow might not be as good as it could be. And so I'd like to proceed to do an arterial circulation examination. 
I suspect the patient suffers from peripheral vascular disease, and so I would like to do an arterial circulation examination, beginning with the femoral pulse. Femoral pulses are normal bilaterally, no bruise heard. Please move on. Okay. Mr. Feldman, I'd now like to take a look at the pulse behind your knee. I just need to bend your knee a little bit, and you're going to feel me pushing behind it just like this as I look for the pulse. This one can be hard to find sometimes. So with the knee in a slightly flexed position, I'm assessing for popliteal pulse intensity bilaterally. Popliteal pulses are equal and normal bilaterally. I'd now like to proceed to do more an evaluation of the peripheral circulation, and I will compare both sides. So with your leg nice and straight, I'm assessing for the posterior tibial pulse on both sides, as well as the dorsalis pedis. I feel both pulses present, equal and bilateral. I'd now like to move on and do um, another examination looking for some of the physical signs of vascular insufficiency. And this would include looking for changes in the skin, hair on his feet, his nails, as well as looking at dependent ruber and pallor on elevation. So Mr. Feldman, I'm just taking a look at your feet. I see that your skin looks normal. You have some hair, which is normal. You have a good capillary refill, which means that the circulation in the very small vessels of your feet is good. Now I'd like to proceed to special maneuvers, and this would include looking at pallor on elevation as well as dependent ruber. Mr. Feldman, I'm just going to lift your leg a little bit. Okay, you don't have to do anything. Just relax. So normally I would maintain the leg in the air like this for about two minutes and be looking at the foot for pallor. A little bit of pallor is normal, but... Noted. You may move on. Okay. And now if I could have you sit up, Mr. Feldman, and just have your feet hang over the side of the bed for me. There you go. All right. Again, I would suspect that this would take a couple of minutes before I would see any redness. Are you okay? <laughs> Thank you. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at Are you a nurse? Oh, Mrs. Miller, I am a nurse. Can you get me some pain medication? That other nurse last night was just awful. She didn't do, she, I only saw her once at the beginning of the shift and I'm really, really uncomfortable and, and I just don't feel good at all. Is there any way you can give me some relief? Well, first off, I need to do a complete assessment on you before I do How long will that take? Uh, 20 minutes. Because well, I'm very busy. And we, you know, we have uh, but, other but patients. But I'm, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable. Is there anybody? She, she didn't do anything for me last night. All right. Well, you know, um, on a scale of one to ten, ten being the worst pain you ever had, one being no pain or zero being no pain. Where's your pain level? Eight or nine, maybe going more. It's just I haven't had anything to work, give me any relief. I haven't had any sleep last night. I kept buzzing the buzzer, and she just wouldn't come in. Well, our. Or can you do anything for me? Let me go check your medication orders. Can you please hurry? Well, you know, you're not the only patient I have today, so I will do it as fast as I can do it. I hope so. All right, I'll be back. If not, I want to talk to your supervisor. Okay. Well, I don't think that's really necessary. It may be. I hope not. Okay. Well, I will go check right now for your pain meds. I'll be back. Thank you.
When Mrs. R arrived on the medical surgical floor, she was an active 67-year-old with peripheral arterial disease in need of an arterial bypass to restore circulation to her leg. The pain in her left calf has been limiting her activities, especially her favorite pastime, gardening. Unfortunately, the graft became blocked two days after surgery. Now Mrs. R requires a below-the-knee amputation. Mrs. R is concerned about returning home after the surgery, as she is widowed and lives alone. Hi, Hi. Susan. I'm Hi. Dr. Hakeem. I have a new red around here. Hi. Okay. Yeah. I, I just George. Thought, I brought George in today because okay. he's just had a really bad fall. I, I just turned my back for a minute. I was just washing up and he just, I don't know, he must have got up onto a chair. I've told right. him time and time again, don't okay. don't go into the cupboard. But he went to the top cupboard to okay. get some sweets or something and he just like fell. Right. And um, I, don't, I don't know what happened, but um, I think he, he hit his hand on, on the work set or something. and. and and he was crying a lot, and I'm just okay. really worried about him. All right, okay. Um, well, I've had a look at the x-ray, yeah. and um, there appears to be uh, a, bro a broken bone oh, um, in his breast. Right. And, but I've also examined him, and there are a couple of bruises that he has on his body. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, he did have, he had a nasty fall. I just said this big okay. crack, All right. crash, and I didn't All know right. what had happened, and I, I was terrified, but... You know, he was just on the floor yeah, crying. I mean, about, children, oh, oh, yeah, really scared. yeah, sometimes children can be clumsy like yeah. that. Oh, he is actually really clumsy. Yeah. I mean, I've told him time and time again, don't stand on that chair, yeah. you know, it'll fall over and then it, it has done. It's okay. It's Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Scott. Yes. Hi, yeah. Hi, I'm Chloe McCauley. I'm one of the baby doctors. Hi. Nice yeah. to meet you. Congratulations. I understand you've just had your first baby, is that right? Yes. 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 Okay, how are you feeling? Um, happy, yeah, although right. these people have been in and out, so yeah. we're a bit on edge and a bit confused. About okay, what's okay. Worried. Well, that's that's why I've come to talk to you. Yeah. Okay. Tell me what you understand so far. What have people said to you? Well, basically, after my wife gave birth mm -hmm. a few hours ago, um, they told us the baby was healthy, yeah. but they couldn't decide decide whether it was a girl or a boy. Okay. Was, and they no one really said anything, and no. they're just whispering. And okay, okay. We're just confused. Okay, well, what you say is absolutely right, and I'm sorry that you feel confused, but yeah. sometimes at the beginning, things aren't clear, and we need a bit of time to okay. sort things out. Excuse me, I'm a little chilly. Can I have that blanket, please? What? What do you mean? The blanket. I'm a little cold. Do we do surgery on your arms? Uh, excuse me? Do we do surgery on your arms? No, but I'm in a lot of pain. I want to, to see you go grab that blanket and pull it up. There is no reason why you can't pull that blanket up. I'm in a lot of, I have a lot of back pain now. Can I have some medication? Well, you're supposed to be in pain. You had surgery, so you're going to be in some pain. Hold, hold on a minute. I have a lot of pain though, man. <sighs> okay, I'll be in in a little bit.
wrote a prescription for antibiotics. Okay. Um, I did want to talk to you though, I'm a little bit concerned looking through his chart at how many ear infections he's had recently and I, I noticed that you had checked the box that someone's smoking in the home. So I was wondering if you can tell me a little more about that. Well, um, it's just me and him and I do smoke. Um, I try really hard not to smoke around him. But I, I've been smoking for 10 years except when I was pregnant with him. But it, everything, it's so stressful being a single mom and, and my having a full-time job. And so it's just, that's why I started smoking again. You have a lot of things going on and smoking's kind of a way to relax and de-stress. Yes. Yeah. Some people have a glass of wine, I have a cigarette. <laughs> sure. And it sounds like you're trying not to smoke around him. Why did you make that decision? I know it's not good for him. I mean, I've read those things about ear infections and asthma and stuff. and and uh, But other kids have ear infections, and their parents don't smoke. So on the one hand, you're worried about how your smoking might be affecting him. And on the other hand, you're not so sure if it's really the smoking that's causing these problems. Right. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have asthma. Yeah, I don't... He hasn't had a lot of other problems that his other friends have. So, and I've thought about quitting before in the past, but I just don't. I just don't see how it's possible right now. What made you decide to quit smoking when you were pregnant? Well, he was inside me, and we were sharing everything, and I knew that he would get some of that, and I didn't. I just didn't didn't think I could live with myself if something happened to him. Right now, though, it feels almost too difficult to even manage or even to try. Yeah, exactly. How were you successful when you quit before? I don't know. I I think about it now. I don't even know how I did it. I just I just did it. You know, I just I just couldn't imagine like him not being born or, or going into labor early mm -hmm. and and him having problems and stuff like that, all the stuff that they talk about with women who smoke. So I, that was just enough to, to say, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to risk that. Mm -hmm. So the risks were so scary then that you were able to stop. Like, yeah. They don't feel as scary to you now. No, I mean, we're two separate people. And like I said, I don't, I try really hard not to smoke around him. I'm pretty good about that. I, I don't let other people smoke around him. Um, so I, you know, you're doing the best you can do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds to me, too, like part of you really does want to quit. Yeah, I, I, I know that I need to. And I, you know, keep every new year, I say, okay, this year I'm going to quit smoking. But then something happens and it, it just doesn't. It's on your to-do list. Happen. It's just not making it to the top. Yeah. If you did decide to quit. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not at all confident, you don't think you could do it, and 10 is you feel pretty certain that you could, where do you think you fall right now? Probably like a 5, kind of in the unsure area. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I've done it before, so I know I can do it, but at the same time, it just seems really hard, and sure. it's not the same situation. Well, what made you say 5 rather than 2 or 3? I know, I know all the ways it's bad for me, and I don't want him to grow up thinking that it's okay to smoke. I don't want him to, to use any kind of, I don't want him to chew or, or anything like that. Um, so I know I need to, especially before he gets old enough to understand mm -hmm. what mommy's doing, but I just don't know if I can do it. Okay. So it sounds like you have a lot of reasons why you'd like to quit. You have been successful quitting in the past. And right now you're just feeling a little bit hesitant about your ability to do it. Yeah. Where do you think we should go from here? I don't know. I, I'd like some help. I just don't know what kind of help I need. Sure. So. Well, if you'd be interested, that's something I can definitely talk to you about. There are a lot of new options that can actually help people be way more successful in their attempt at quitting. There's different medications you can try. I don't like medicine. Okay. There's also a lot of support groups and classes that you can take where you have other people to go through it with you. And sometimes just having that support can be a big part of it, especially for people like you where smoking is such a stress reliever. That sounds nice, but I'm not sure if I have the time for all that. Sure. It feels like something that would take up a lot of time and maybe not fit into your life. I wonder if we could talk about some options that might fit into your life. That would be really nice.
Okay, well, if you're willing, then we could set up another appointment where you could come in and we could talk more about that. I would like that. That would be great. Great. Here on the Health Report, we cover all sorts of search. The Mediterranean diet, what fat is right for you, how much salt is safe, diets to protect you from diabetes, early death, heart disease. So this next segment is actually a bit perturbing. We're being told that almost all this research is wrong. Yes, John Ioannidis is Professor of Medicine at Stanford University, and he says the scientific approach taken by nutritional researchers is nowhere near rigorous enough, and we have to go back to basics if we're to learn anything significant about how diets impact health. Thank you for inviting me. Now, we've had you on lots of times before, talking about various things and uh, demolishing a few iconic areas of health and research. You're arguing that nutritional research needs radical reform. On what basis do you say that? Well, th there's clearly a factory of papers being produced in uh, nutrition uh, epidemiology in particular that don't meet very high standards of credibility. The type of research that is being done in nutritional epidemiology, it's not an issue that there's bad scientists involved in it. You know, maybe excellent scientists are involved in it, but the odds of getting it right are extremely small. Let's look at that in a moment, but you quote in your paper some really bizarre conclusions that you might come to from, uh, if you have believed, past nutritional research. Do you want to just tell us some of those bizarre findings in their the relation to either longevity or shortened lifespan? Most of these studies are not experimental. They're not randomized. They're just uh, observing people who report what they eat and they take that seriously that this is reflecting exactly what they ate, which is one major assumption. Second, people take these behaviors and these numbers as causal, which means that they look at the numbers and they translate them to an effect of these nutrients or of these foods on mortality. And then they also make a another assumption that uh, these risks are applicable to the entire lifespan. So then uh, let's take a number like 15% uh, relative risk reduction in mortality or 15% increase in survival which is a typical number that comes out of these studies. And this is uh, the number that is the summary of all the data, for example, on what is the benefit with eating 12 hazelnuts a day. Mm -hmm. uh, if you translate that to a gain in uh, survival, you take 80 years, you multiply that by 15%. This looks like a 12-year gain in survival just by eating 12 hazelnuts a day. Or or literally one hazelnut a day would give you one more year of life uh, as a benefit. It's a ridiculous calculation. It is not so, of course. Even if you believe that one of these foods or one of these nutrients or a couple of them may be important, it's impossible to believe that every single food, every single nutrient will have such tremendous benefits or such tremendous risks. So you, you get there because of there's multiple levels of unreliability. Is that what it is? That essentially the food diary is unreliable, 
they're not controlling for other factors such as education and other environmental factors properly and they all conflate together to give you bizarre results? Is that what's going on? Exactly. It's a, it's a problem at multiple levels. It's an extremely difficult field to study. And it doesn't mean that observational studies, that epidemiological studies get it wrong all the time. In many other fields, the problems are much more straightforward. For example, we know for sure that smoking is killing zillions of people. It will kill one billion people in the next century unless we do something. But the, the effect uh, of smoking is huge. Uh, the, the risk increases 20-fold if uh, someone is smoking for getting lung cancer. But just to challenge you on that, whilst we're confident in smoking, why are we confident in smoking and not in coffee? Because there have been no randomized controlled trials of getting people to smoke and other people not to smoke. I mean, so that's still on observational studies, is it not? The major difference with smoking is that the uh, the effect is tremendous. Uh, we're talking, as I said, of a 20-fold increase in risk of lung cancer, 10-fold increase in cardiovascular disease, and many other diseases have tremendous increase in risk. For each single nutrient, each single uh, things that we eat or drink, the effects, even if you take these studies literally, are much, much, much smaller. And based on what we know from some randomized trials that we have done, the effects are pretty much close to null, if not exactly null. I mean, it's very likely that they're exactly null, which means that it's a complete waste to even try to pursue them any further. What about we cannot really use epidemiology to study a relative risk of 1.01. We can do it to study a relative risk of 20, which is what's the case for smoking. And just to dissect that out for a non, people who don't know the statistics, is that 1.01 is, there's no effect, 1.01 is just tiny, whereas 20, an effect of 20 is 20 times the risk. So 1.01 is just a little bit over what would be normal and probably within normal limits. So uh, what about eating patterns? I mean, you yourself have been involved in trials of the Mediterranean diet. So I think that eating patterns in theory might be able to get you a little bit of that complexity of all these nutrients interacting together. But even those are very difficult, if not impossible, to study within an observational context. Again, you have most of these problems operating. Number one, you need to ask people what type of eating pattern they're following, and you know, responses may be accurate or very often may be very inaccurate, especially if you try to recall what you ate and tell what you're doing. Just try it to yourself and, <laughs> and, and see whether that information would be reliable. The second problem is that you still have extreme complexity among all these nutrients. We have over 200,000 different foods that you can combine in different ways. There's no clear eating pattern that each one of us is following. We follow different eating patterns in different periods of our lives and different days even. And it also changes all the time. If you superimpose the way that we react to all of these uh, chemicals that we digest, our metabolic profile, also our genetic profile might affect how we react. Circumstances, uh, our environment, socioeconomic factors that dictate what we decide to eat or not eat and what we do or don't do with our life at the same time, it's an extremely complex.